contribution from Sasserburg, the only person who really knows the, the Fischer-Tropsch synthesis in practice, Dr. Drive, who will speak on Fischer-Tropsch synthesis over iron cattle. Now, according to the literature, for what it's worth, 
the kinetics of cobalt does not contain uh, a factor of water vapor. So that should you have a cobalt and an iron catalyst with the same intrinsic activity, then kinetically cobalt should outperform it in a real reactor. So that's an advantage for cobalt. Um, now going back to fixed bed iron catalysts, we find in practice that as time goes on, you lose both activity and selectivity. To try to figure out what goes on inside a reactor, we have on many occasions carefully unloaded these single tubes and collected about, say, 20 samples down the length of the bed. And each of these samples we then take to the lab and uh, measure the actual fission trap activity in uh, differential reactors. Uh, we check on the areas, the porosities, this uh, analyze all kinds of things. Now let's look at what we find as far as the uh, profile goes, the activity profile. So the activity, the main entry on the left, and the exit the situation on the right. The top curve is for a young catalyst, and as you can see, there's not much effect of bed position or activity. The middle curve is for an old catalyst, and the bottom curve is for a very, pretty, uh, even much older catalyst. Uh, what is clear that there is marked deactivation at the entry e uh, area. There is also a considerable deactivation at the exit area. Not much, not as much, but certainly a, a big whack. By right? incidentally, there's no scale, it's not just a percent. Uh, this is just uh, artist impression, if you wish. But the, the thing to notice is about a third into the bed, there is a peak. And in that area, there is, relatively speaking, little deactivation. So what this tells one is that intrinsically, iron is not an unstable catalyst. The question, however, is what's happening in the front end and what's happening in the back end? Right, we have a look at these surface areas and things like that. And that is a typical plot you get. Uh, as you enter the bed and go towards the bottom, you find that the surface area decreases. Um, confirming this, we find that the X-ray line broadening uh, indicates that the crystallite size of the iron carbon, carbon uh, iron carbide is small on top and progressively increases in size. This is simply corroborating the surface area. So there we have a real symmetry effect. Um, on top of this, the X-ray analysis also clearly shows that as you proceed into the bed, the degree of oxidation of the catalyst increases. So the combination of increased oxidation and increased, uh, probably hydrothermal sintry, simply means loss of active site. So I think it's a pretty sure case that the deactivation at the bottom end of the bed is due to oxidation hydrothermal sintry. However, you can clearly see that doesn't account for the situation at the front end of the bed, because they in fact the area is the maximum, just like size of the smallest, so why is it deactivated? And the answer comes out pretty simply when you look at the sulfur distribution. If you analyze the catalyst of sulfur, incidentally, before I mention this, um, Sasson uses the so-called retrosol process to purify its gas. And we typically, the gas content of sulfur is less than 0.05 parts per million, which on the industrial scale is, is pretty good going. So you can't, we can't do much better than that as far as the moving sulfur goes. However, we still get sulfur on the cap. And as you can see, incidentally, I'm sorry to say the zero is about there. Um, that's a bit misleading. It does not require that there's sulfur throughout the bed. So the sulfur penetrates to about one third into the bed and then it flattens off. Now, if you recall the activity profile, I said it peaked one third into the bed, and here we see the sulfur penetrates one third into the bed. So it's very tempting to say, well, there you are, there's the reason. The main reason for front end deactivation is sulfur contamination, which is obviously a well known point. But briefly, this is not the brush side of the possibility that coke might be contributing to the decline. Um, uh, I bet it's a fine coke, inverted commas. It's the material that stays behind after you've extracted the catalyst. For various solvents, remove the waxes, you 
you went to treat the vent cell to move all the metals, and finally you blasted it with the hydrochloric acid to remove the slave from gas. And that is what we call coke. Uh, however, the hydrocarbon the hydrogen carbon ratio is about one. It seems like aromatics, but in an analysis, both IR and NMR show in fact there are no aromatics present. This brings a bell of the work uh, EOP has done also. So then our conclusion is that the so-called coke is not really coke, it's simply a mixture of very high molecular weight waxes and some elemental carbon. So overall, just to recap, the front end deactivation in my opinion is mainly sulfur. The back end deactivation is mainly uh, hydrothermal sintering stroke oxidation. Let's have a quick look at what happens to the wax selectivity of these samples. Uh, the profile here is quite different. First thing you can see there's no peak. Otherwise, uh, once again, you see a large drop in selectivity in the front end and relatively speaking, much less selectivity loss at the, at the back end of the bed, despite the lower activity there. Now, wax selectivity is determined primarily by three parameters. So hydrogen steel ratio inside the reactor, the temperature of the bed, and finally the alkali, the, the level of that, or its distribution. Um, now, as these tests I've been showing you were all carried out in the direction of the bottom reactors where the gas was fixed and the temperature was fixed, we can only really discuss the alkali because the others weren't uh, involved. Now, potassium migration could be a factor, but certainly not bulk phase because the analysis of the catalyst all the way down the bed is unchanged. But there could be, uh, it's well known that uh, potassium creeps around the surface. You, you reduce the catalyst. Originally, the, the alkali is badly dispersed after reduction, it creeps all over the iron. But as you build up carbon, in fact, alkali keeps on creeping, it creeps onto the carbon. So effectively, the iron surface, or the carbide surface, is being depleted of potassium as the potassium creeps around. So that's a possible contributing factor. But once again, I think uh, sulfur poison is probably uh, the major uh, fact character here because after all the sulfide iron is highly electronegative and just to speak in very general terms uh, an electronegative iron will simply neutralize if you wish uh, a electropositive iron like potassium is after all is the main promoter for producing wax so I think it's simply uh, sulfide knocking out the potassium effect Coke I think actually dealt with it it might uh, come into the picture either simply by blanketing the alkali, because the alkali sites do enhance coke formation, but it's also probably creeping around in the alkali onto the coke. All right, so far I've just been speaking about fixed beds. Let's have a quick look at uh, what happens with the high temperature fluid ion bed setup. Once again, we get a similar setup. With diamond stream, we find that the activity and the selectivity slowly decline. The reasons are, again, I don't have to repeat them all, mainly sulfur and coke. But this time there are some real operational differences. In a fluidized bed, obviously, the sulfur will contaminate all of the catalyst because it's a highly turbulent thing, and some sulfur comes in continuously, it will kill all the catalyst that's around. The coke at this time really is aromatic, and this is simply because we operate at a much higher temperature. So, and there's no, no doubt about the the coke aspect being aromatic there. Incidentally, what I want to stress is that on iron catalysts operating at high temperatures, it's important to distinguish between true coke and simply elemental carbon. Um, anything above 300 typically, iron deposits a lot of carbon. And that's simply the Boudoir reaction, which is very active. It's enhanced by alkali conversion. In fact, if you take a sample of a catalyst out of a running commercial reactor after, say, a couple of weeks, and you analyze it, you will find that there is more carbon on the catalyst than there is iron. Uh, and in spite of that, there's been, relatively speaking, no reactivation. In fact, if we take an example of this, what they call a fixed fluidized bed, when the particle swells as a result of carbon deposition, the bed actually expands in height 
So your contact time actually increases. So in fact, what you observe in practice is a slight increase in conversion of time. And luckily enough, and then only a slow tailing off of performance. So really my message here is, um, carbon per se is not a catalyst deactivator. You may come to it. Now you might wonder what the catalyst looked like with all the mass of carbon lying around. And with the aid of the electron microscope, scanning electron microscope uh, through a polished section, this is the kind of picture one gets. The particle on the left is a small particle, those little black dots or blue dots, they represent little islands of iron carbon embedded in a sea of carbon. A very active character. Uh, if you look at the larger particle, you find the same phenomenon on the outside, but in the core, you have a solid chunk of magnetite. Now, that is not really surprising if you consider what happens uh, as the gas enters an active particle. Um, obviously, the hydrogen and the CO get uh, converted, and we end up with water vapor. So that as you penetrate into the particle, the, the gas atmosphere becomes more and more oxidized. And in eventually, of course, it's going to be oxidized in the core. Um, nevertheless, it doesn't seem to, it's one of the reasons why it's in fact not necessary to reduce 100% in the first place, because you are you re oxidize it within hours. So, right else. Now, to change the subject completely, just to end up with, I'd like to very briefly review uh, some reactive developments at Sasquatch over the last uh, several years. We have basically three types of reactors <coughs> operating in such commercial reactors now. On the left-hand side, you have the so-called fixed bed reactor. It <coughs> operates at relatively low temperatures. The objective is to make wax. The two other reactors are fluidized bed reactors. The one in the middle is the, uh, is the old one, which is well known. The synthol reactor, and the one on the right is a new development. Uh, these two reactors are, operate very similarly. The objective is light ovens and gasoline. Now, okay, what, was, what we've done that's new. The uh, reactors on the left, the fixed bed reactors, were designed for 27 atmospheres. They were reactors that are actually still running up 30 years. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we put up a new fixed bed reactor operating with 45 atmospheres. Now, uh, it's a 50% increase in uh, pressure. Now, what, what in effect happens, if, if you say double the pressure, you actually double the amount of fresh gas fed to the reactor. Otherwise, it's not much point, you're going to buy a pressure. So you feed more gas, and then you find you get the same percent from those. In other words, you've doubled the production. So the advantage of high pressure is higher production per unit of reactor, <coughs> or capital volume, in a way. Right, we did much the same thing on the central reactor, the so-called synthol circulating fluid bed system. The old reactor that just the one operated around about 20 atmospheres, and when we went to the new big new plants, we uh, increased the capacity of those reactors by a factor of three each. And we did that by increasing both the pressure and the actual physical dimension of the reactor. So once again, we utilized the kinetics for higher pressure to increase production. Uh, the one on the right is a uh, very recent development, so-called fixed fluid as bed, uh, but I don't want to spend any time on that because that is a, a subject of a separate talk later this afternoon. Now, you say, why am I telling you all this? <laughs> the idea is that the only remaining reactor that we at Sasso need to demonstrate on a large scale is the so-called slurry phase reactor. Now, I, I, I've been telling you about the development of the big new FFP. You'll get more detail later on. Now, the point is, in the development of that fixed fluid bed reactor, we obviously went through a demonstration unit where we put those in about a meter uh, diameter, a nice size from which you could scale up. Now, that reactor has done its job because the commercial reactor is running. Now, we have this reactor available. In fact, we've converted this reactor into a slurry phase reactor. So soon we'll be able to uh, cover the entire field of reactor designs. Uh, you can say, why are we interested in the study? In our case, we're interested in making wax. We can emphasize that. It's not just for production, because in my opinion, that can beat the fluidized bed system, previous reactors. 
But to make wax, then you have to compare it with the fixed bed reactor. And the capital cost of, of a slurry bed reactor is about half that of a fixed, of a fixed bed reactor. So there's a big incentive there. The operating cost is considerably low, mainly because the differential pressure, the cost of the reactor is lower, that means less energy. And the online time should be higher. In practice, a fixed bed has to be unloaded every now and then with new capital charge, whereas in the study bed, you can uh, recharge capital or take some out and put some in online. So you have less downtime as well. Um, okay, so the proof of the pudding, of course, is, is yet to come. And maybe next time around, we can give you some results. Thank you. Questions? Carl? Uh, Mark, two questions. First, uh, in the synthol reactor, it uh, wasn't clear to me if you have the activation problem. Uh, you, you said you didn't really have uh, any loss of activity due to the carbon no. formation. Yes. Uh, yes and no. We can, I would say the problem with uh, the two that bed reactor is mentioned mechanical. As the bed, as you lay down carbon, even though intrinsically the campus activity doesn't go down much, of course it's all sulfur sulfur point, don't get me wrong. Um, but there is a problem, but there's no such thing as a perfect cycler. You will lose a small fraction of the very fine light material. And as you lay down carbon, you notice uh, do, things, things are pretty round because it's a pretty turbulent situation, high speed linear velocity. The, the throughput of these reactors are tremendous, so there's very high velocity as well. So you, you get these particles around. And there's bound to be a scouring of that iron-carbon mix. And those lots of fines are blown out of the reactor, but there's a scrubber system for that. So that, that's all part of the design. And it's always expected. So and what I mean is you are continuously throwing capital out. So and that is one of the main factors of the, of the loss of activity. Yeah. OK. Uh, second question dealt with the uh, fixed bed. I'm uh, surprised that you were getting cindering. But then uh, we've had some experience with unsupported iron, unpromoted, centering very easily at, at, at typical reaction temperatures. If we, if we add 1% alumina, we can avoid those centering problems. Uh, and, and have you tried alumina? Uh, no. In general, I don't like alumina for iron capitals. Uh, because there's sort of a contradiction here. And an iron capitals needs, let's call it, a basic atmosphere. And alumina is acidic. You find in India to add so much uh, uh, calculi to make the alumina, to get the selectivity right, by which time you virtually drown the poor animal in an alkali and the activity goes down. That's, that's what I experience being. I know zero that's no good either. So you, you it's contradiction of facts. So acid, acid support and, and iron, uh, which has to be basisified, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So you can't tolerate even the 1%. Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, I, I'm saying, in fact, for our simple capital, we use iron ore. Run of the mill iron ore. Um, we, ad we adjust the promoter context. That's our magic formula. But these are the no, I, was, I was thinking if the centering is a problem, that's what we can solve. Yeah. No, I mean, of course, our fixed bed cap is also a problem, but it's not your mind. You mentioned two major problems sulfur on the one hand and water on the other. Uh, with the sulfur, molybdenum comes in mind. Molysulfide also is a Fischer-Tropsch catalyst, and it loves sulfur, and it doesn't get deactivated so easily. The cost certainly would compare favorably uh, with r ruthenium, I think that's what you mentioned. Yeah, if you realize what space velocity you're working at, and you're getting 100% conversion, molybdenum will never do that. The conversion is the activity that we are. I, I, I cannot tell that. The other one with the water, the water gas shift reaction comes in mind. Seems to me if you can convert it to CO2, you might do better. Now there are several low or high temperature, in fact high temperature water gas shift is so iron. The iron cap is, is about the best water gas shift. We've got a massive water gas shift cap. The reactor itself is very active. The high temperature synthol reactor, the shift is more than your liver. So adding a shift cap is no point. It already is a very good shift cap. Do you get, do you get me? Uh, no, the the shift is in equilibrium. You cannot do any better than no. that. That's the high temperature operation. But the low temperature operation, the shift is not in equilibrium.
should, should in fact then make a lot more CO2, but you don't because of the low temperature. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. No, uh, I don't think that's worth your while. What we've done, remember, we, we've got about 2,000 tubes per react. Uh, it's not so easy to selectively uh, wash out the material. But let me just tell you what's already published. This is not news. Uh, what, you, what we have done, tried many years back, is in the pilot model, where we just take a single tube, you can, uh, say, flush out with a light gasoline cut or something to dissolve all the heavy wax out. And you do get, in the media, you will decrease in conversion. But within 10 minutes, you're back to where you were. Uh, it's simply, the pores fill up with wax again, because often you're making wax. So as soon as the pores are full of wax, you're back to your, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a transport <laughs> So that the, the very high moral wax is not really a problem. Remember, those that are produced are just being pushed out. It's, uh, you're producing the wax inside the particle, and it just, it's self flushing all the time. But the particle is filled with wax. So that the wax angle is, is to be now here and there. You always have molten wax on your cap, so whether it's uh, high ball weight or intermediate ball weight, it doesn't matter all that much. It's not worth uh, washing it up. Well, I'm afraid we, we are running behind time. Thank you very much for your. Very good The last paper we have presented by Professor Barbara Liu from Brigham Young University, recent technological developments.